effective. And next we have Dr. Eric Cohen, who is the Senior Medical Director in Pharmacovigilance and Patient Safety at AbbVie. He um, sits on the, as a co-chair of their Hepatic Internal Safety Advisory Group, and as well, he is a member of the IQ Dilly Working Group um, leaders. And so, um, with that, Eric, I'm going to pass it over to you. We're using this. Green is for the red The green is laser. The screen. Thank you, Nick. This November, <clears throat> this November will mark uh, 10 years since I left clinical practice and joined industry. And I remember my first day at work, two quotes in particular. It had been that very week that a triple regimen of direct acting antivirals for hepatitis C virus was approved. And so there was a celebration in the department and a cake was brought up from the cafeteria and 30 or 40 individuals were circled around the cake and the vice president of development wanted to make a speech. And he said, Eric, you see how easy it is to get drugs approved? And everybody had a laugh and I probably just had a smile on my face from and, and a surge of adrenaline from hearing my name. Following that, I had my first one on one meeting with my new manager. And we sat down in his office. And he said, our job in drug development is to kill drugs as quickly as possible. I thought, what an unusual way to think about it, but it made a lot of sense from a resource perspective. In the case of drug induced liver injury, that would be a tall order because this is a very rare diagnosis to make. And here we have a, a picture of High Zimmerman lecturing on the mechanisms of Dilly from 1970. And we've been learning about the nuances of Dilly now for over 50 years. And yet, the majority of cases that we see we still consider impossible to predict. And even making the diagnosis using the gold standard criteria, the Dilly network criteria, using phrases like possible, probable, unlikely, or the dreaded insufficient information. So without a doubt, there are a lot of unmet needs in the field in clinical medicine and drug development with regards to drug-induced liver injury. Together with cardiovascular disease, Dilly ranks top two for major causes of early termination from development and withdrawal from the market. It's a frequent cause for regulatory action and limiting drug use. There are lack of biomarkers for risk assessment diagnosis and outcome prediction, and limited translatability of non-clinical findings. So today I want to touch upon the industry perspective on human DILI and highlight impact of complex in vitro models on potential IND submissions. And I'm going to start with three totally hypothetical and purposely vague examples of paradigms of Dilly that we see in drug development, if only to stimulate some thought, ideas, and conversation at this workshop. Here we have patient A, a healthy volunteer in a phase one single ascending dose trial who receives a study drug and several days later, on routine lab testing, we see a mild bump in ALT, no symptoms. Maybe this case is adjudicated as probable or a possible relationship to drug, and nothing more is made of it. The individual feels fine, is discharged, and, an, and not another case is seen for the rest of drug development 
thousands of individuals dosed and nothing. Wouldn't it be nice to know at that early time point in development that this patient's histology looked like what we see on the screen? Where, oops, where we have on the left that, that big uh, lucency is the portal vein. a muscular hepatic artery, and a bile duct, that's the portal triad, zone one of the liver, and what we see is way too many purple stained nuclei. That's a brisk inflammatory infiltrative lymphocytes. And this would be the acute hepatitis phenotype, an idiosyncratic reaction, which can go on to lead to jaundice, and death or transplant in 10% of cases. This is a big deal. Wouldn't it have been nice to know that that's what we were dealing with so early on before uh, the drug is developed further? Patient B, this is a diagnosis that's a bit easier to make on the spot. We've got a morbilliform reaction on this gentleman's chest and extremities and He's being treated in a phase three clinical trial, and together with this rash, we again see an elevation of ALT, fever, rash, maybe eosinophilia, and this is a severe cutaneous reaction called DRESS syndrome, which also carries a mortality of 10%, and it's a big deal, though it doesn't necessarily get the same publicity as the other phenotype I just showed you, where does this phenotype fit into the spectrum of in vitro models that we're developing? How will it be addressed? And here's a third example. And now we're talking about post-approval, which is notorious for insufficient information. And the details are vague. Someone's treated with a drug, develops elevated ALT, and now an, a, an anti-nuclear antibody that's positive. Case is adjudicated and felt to be a drug-induced autoimmune hepatitis, yet a third discrete phenotype of DILI. Or is it? Maybe this is just a susceptible individual from the right demographic who developed an idiopathic autoimmune hepatitis that has nothing to do with the study drug. Well, not a, not a study drug, but a drug on market. Or consider a third possibility. Maybe the drug served as an environmental trigger for an underlying chronic autoimmune liver disease, which then speaks to an indirect mechanism of drug-induced liver injury. And it gets confusing and complicated. So again, what if we had a priori from the beginning of development, a pretest probability of understanding the likelihood of a drug and its mechanism to lead to triggering of autoimmunity? And I don't apologize for how messy this slide might look because it's to serve an important point. And that's to recognize that there are at least 15 different discrete phenotypes of drug-induced liver injury in humans. And I've covered just a few of them, but a main one at the top left is acute hepatic necrosis. It's the number one cause of acute liver failure in the US. And it doesn't only target hepatocytes and produce other things like the steatotic phenotypes like hepatic steatosis and acute fatty liver, which we have here in the middle, but it can, it can impact other cell types like the cholangiocytes and bile ducts, giving us phenotypes like the bland cholestasis and mixed cholestatic hepatitis, which may make up even 50% of all drug-induced liver injuries. And other biliary phenotypes like vanishing bile duct syndrome, secondary sclerosing cholangitis. What about the vasculature? Blood vessels are also targets of drugs and can lead to DILI. 
And here we have examples like sinusoidal obstruction syndrome, nodular regenerative hyperplasia, one of the causes of a non serotic portal hypertension, and peliosis hepatis. And then there's some miscellaneous ones like granulomatous hepatitis, thought to be related to a chronic drug induced liver injury, and neoplasia from androgen use or oral contraceptive use. I showed you a cutaneous syndrome dress, but that's not the only one. Let's not forget Stevens Johnson syndrome, toxic and toxic epidermal necrolysis, which has liver involvement almost half the time and high mortality rates. How do we think about phenotypes of Dili as we're developing our complex in vitro models? Do we use phenotype as a way to put it all together? Or maybe we use one of the other multiple facets of human Dili. Mark mentioned the three categories of direct, idiosyncratic, and indirect. There are 11 or more potential mechanisms, and here I'm talking about things on the cellular or organelle level. Three biochemical patterns of DILI, hepatocellular, cholestatic, and mixed, which we use in the industry to help form differential diagnoses with case adjudication. And despite all the phenotypes, all the mechanisms, and all these different categories and the complexity, the diagnostic biomarkers that we use are still painfully rudimentary. AST, ALT, alkaline phosphatase, bilirubin. That's really it. That doesn't mean that these models have to be restricted to such limited biomarkers, and that's what's really exciting. Looking at it from the perspective of the three categories of DILI, I see complex in vitro models as very well suited to detect direct hepatotoxicity. And this can be very helpful in drug development with lead optimization, due diligence, and early on in development in preclinical and phase one. But what's really key and what's such a big unmet need is the idiosyncratic hepatotoxicity because it's so, it's so rare. And there are such limitations with animal models. There are not good models out there to help us get that pretest probability and ability to understand hepatotoxicity when we see it, but we don't recognize it because of insufficient information. It also gives us opportunities to screen, for example, human donor genotypic variability, study drug-drug interactions, and then there's this indirect category, which again is when a drug exacerbates an underlying condition that's already present. That might be considered future directions at this point. I don't know if these models can reactivate a hepatitis B virus or have insulin uh, resistance get exacerbated or underlying autoimmunity get triggered. Maybe what we need to focus on with the de development of these models are the different potential mechanisms. And as I look through the literature in preparation for this workshop, I was encouraged because I saw that so many of these mechanisms are already in play with these models. And there's hope that one day one or a collection of models can tackle the majority, if not all, of these different mechanisms and give drug developers the tools needed to cover all the bases with the different phenotypes that may come about during the long course of development. Things like the reactive metabolites and DAMPs, the danger signals, BCEP, metabolizing enzymes, mitochondrial toxicity and oxidative stress, and the various immune responses. I feel like there's tremendous opportunity there. And as I mentioned, maybe the breadth of diagnostic biomarkers can really be augmented 
here versus what we have as tools in the clinic. So even though we don't have intact biliary systems in our models yet, that doesn't mean that we can't identify surrogate biomarkers of cholestasis or surrogate biomarkers of mitochondrial function and dysfunction and biomarkers of hepatocyte damage and autoimmunity and other immune stimulation. What I did see is that Kupfer cells and stellate cells are already in use, and maybe these two cell types are part of a downstream common pathway to a lot of the different immune-mediated immune mechanisms. And we have to ask ourselves, is that enough just to look at the common pathways at the end, or are we going to have to get more sophisticated to identify, to use different cell types and different biomarkers to identify the many different immune-mediated phenotypes and pathways that are out there. And how does CIVM impact IND submissions? I think in many ways it's going to be very helpful. As part of a non-clinical toxicology package, whether a in vitro system is validated or not, I think it can be a helpful adjunct to other studies that are performed to help form rationales and conclusions that are presented in these packages. And for the first time, I'm using red font on this slide to, to highlight the importance of pretest probability and this concept throughout drug development. It could be so helpful in so many ways for a developer to know from the outset what phenotypes and what likelihoods to look out for during development to inform study design and case adjudication and on and on. These models can support rationale for conducting or non, not conducting phase one liver safety studies and can impact design of regist registrational trials in the form of screening labs, frequency of surveillance, exclusion criteria, and discontinuation rules. I also wonder, is there a role for complex in vitro models to help predict adaptation? Mark showed an E-dish plot, and sometimes you get an imbalance in the right lower quadrant, referred to as Temple's corollary. And sometimes it's thought that when there's imbalance there without overt right upper quadrant highs cases, that that's still a risk for severe liver injury. But what if it just represents examples of a drug where the liver can adapt quite easily? Can these models predict that? And I'll leave you with this. In pharmacovigilance, especially for a clinician, the great frustration is dealing with incomplete pictures insufficient information and being asked to draw conclusions and make decisions. But every once in a while, you get a case where everything is very clear. Like take this one, which probably came from the Spanish Dili registry. This to me is a clear cut case of High's Law. The jaundice is easy to see. Billy Rubin is probably greater than three. And you've got severe hepatitis with this enlarged liver. And with that, I'll say thank you. And we can probably all use a bathroom break. <laughs> Thank you very much, Eric. Um, and thank you to the, the first four presenters today. I really enjoyed your, your talks and, and gaining perspective on what we'd like to pursue for, for qualifying complex in vitro models, looking at DILI and assessing DILI. Um, we will take a short break right now. Um, I know we ran a few minutes over, so let's come back at, at uh, 1045.